Hi everybody, it is Liz Denoon here. It is Dyslexia Empowerment Month. Welcome to another live to talk about dyslexia indicators. Today we're going to be covering dyslexia indicators or signs or symptoms for primary school or elementary school children. Red is the colour for Dyslexia Awareness Month. You can see I've got my very red summery dress on today. Um, it is not summery in Melbourne today, but I am toughing it out because it's all about red. So let's get into it because there are lots of indicators for primary school to get through. And I want to give you a little bit of a description about each because I know that that helps you um, in terms of what you're thinking about your own children. So if a child appears to be struggling with spelling, reading, writing or numeracy, how do you know whether their difficulties are potentially dyslexia or not? There are some obvious signs and these are things that you can look out for. One is a spiky profile. There are two descriptions of a spiky profile. One can be the child has incredible areas of strength, but then really detrimental areas of weakness. So for example, they may be super creative, super musical, orally competent in on a very high level. Their understanding of the world might be really highly structured, but they may struggle with reading and spelling. So that's what you call a spiky profile. There are these highs and lows in their areas of abilities. Now an educational psychologist would also say to you that when they do their diagnostic testing, they can also see a spiky profile within their testing results. So in some areas they're going to do extremely well and in other areas they might be in the fifth percentile. They might be very low. So that's another way you can sort of see if dyslexia is maybe on the cards by looking at the spiky profiles. Because the thing about dyslexia is it is not specific to intelligence. So somebody with dyslexia can be just of average intelligence, but they can also be super intelligent. And I know quite a few dyslexic people in that category who are really capable and uh, really have achieved amazing things in their lifetimes. So remember, not all dyslexic children are going to, are going to display the same signs and symptoms in the same way because every child, teenager, adult, elderly person, toddler is different and they will show their traits and symptoms and signs in different ways. I have three children with dyslexia and they are all very different in the way the dyslexia manifests but there are some commonalities in them. Reading, writing and spelling was difficult for all of them my middle son, once I sorted out a visual processing for him, his reading rate increased out of sight. Um, so they're all very different. Um, so let's look for some general signs. Speed of processing is one that tends to get everybody with dyslexia. A number one reason why it is important to have relaxed time limits on tests, exams and assignments for people who have a diagnosis of dyslexia because it will take them longer to get through certain tasks. And that might be written or spoken English. They can have poor concentration, difficulty following instructions, and they may forget words and sometimes find it hard to find the right words, but not, of course, all dyslexic people have that. Some are incredibly orally competent. Think of Richard Branson, for example, who is an absolute gun when it comes to oral speaking. So let's hone in on written work now and I do have a list either side of my um, camera here because I want to get through this list. It's from the British Dyslexia Association. It's just a nice succinct list that kind of covers all the boxes that you might need to know about. So written work. We're talking about the ability to either write with a pen or pencil or even to type with um, a computer. So they may have a poor standard of written work compared with their oral ability. They may only write two or three sentences, but they might be able to tell you the most amazing stories. There's a definite um, disparity between the two skills. 
they may produce messy work with many crossings out and words rewritten several times. Um, for example, they might write the word type three different ways in the same piece of writing. And uh, so I know a certain dyslexic who will actually write in a messy fashion to hide their misspellings because they want people to be unsure as to whether they've spelt things correctly or incorrectly and not be really sure and to give them the benefit of the doubt. They can be confused by letters that look similar. P, B, Q, G, D, all have a very similar structure. They just have different um, representations, representations on the page. They can have poor, poor handwriting. This is commonly called dysgraphia. Graphia being the graphic symbols on the page. Dys meaning difficulty, so difficulty to write. You might hear the word dysgraphia. That can also co, um, be co-aligned with people with dyslexia. They can, I've uh, said, spell words different ways in the same piece of writing. They can make anagrams of words. For example, they might write tried for tired um, or bread for beard. Um, Brian for brain is another one I have seen numbers of times. They can produce badly set out work. Um, they can't stay close to the margin or follow lines down the page. They may have an unusual or poor pencil grip. They can produce phonetic phonetic in other words how it sounds when they write spelling as opposed to how it actually should be think of all those words that are phonetically very difficult to sound out um, and that can often show really bizarre spellings in their work um, what else have I got here uh, they can use unusual sequencing in letters and words um, now let's jump into reading so slow reading progress this is one that i believe is common to just about every single person i've ever come across that has got dyslexia or is showing dyslexic traits they can find it difficult to blend letters together to make sounds and to know which letters to blend together so a letter blend is a bit like a digraph or a trigraph where a number of letters come together to represent one sound and though can be they can have unusual blendings they can have difficulty establishing syllable divisions in words or knowing the beginnings or endings of words they can have unusual pronunciations of words yesterday i was telling you about uh, the word um, with or with with that very successful entrepreneur i know they can have no expression when they read and very poor comprehension. I often put this down to the fact that they are trying so hard to work out what the word on the page is and to decode that comprehension and expression goes out the window because all of their focus is going on the decoding process. It's a really common sign of struggling readers and spellers to do that. They can be hesitant and labored when they're reading, especially when they're reading aloud. One of the reasons that they should always be asked if they would like to read as opposed to being put on the spot and being told they should be reading. They can miss out words when they're reading or add in extra words. They can fail to recognize familiar words. I know when all of my children were learning to read, they could read or I could tell them one word on one page of their reading book but they then couldn't identify that that was the same word on subsequent pages of their reading book. Although to me, it was what I would consider a simple word, potentially even a phonetic word or a sight word. They couldn't actually see that it was the same word, even though they'd only just had it explained to them literally minutes before. That's a really uh, good indicator of dyslexia, I believe. Um, they can lose the point of a story that's being written or read to them. And you know what? It can actually be an auditory story as well. So it might be a news report. They might say to you, what's that about again? What are they talking about? 
I didn't understand what that story is about. This particularly comes in when teachers are giving instructions and they get to the end of the session of instruction giving and they have no idea what they're meant to be doing. The same applies in reading. They can have difficulty picking out the most important points from a passage, making it super hard for them to do comprehension. And my biggest tip to overcome that is to give them a highlighter and every time they think they come across what they consider to be an important point, they highlight it and that's that way when they've got to go back and answer comprehension questions, they can actually go back and identify and find those highlighted sections without trying to decode and decipher the whole passage again. Let's have a look at numeracy now. You would not have thought that numeracy would be part of dyslexia, but there are very similar learning patterns in English and language acquisition as there are in maths. And the one that just jumps out to me straight away without even reading my list is worded maths problems. They cause so much stress and drama and they certainly did for my children as they were going through school. And they continue to use them, worded math problems, and they continue to put them on all of our standardised tests, which if you have a child who's really good at maths, gives them a real disadvantage from day one if they're trying to compete against children who are capable readers. So confusion with place value, with units, with tens, with hundreds, confusion with symbols, the symbols, they're again, they're just graphemes like the alphabet symbols are, but we've got the plus, the division, the subtraction. We've got brackets, bod mass, if you know what that is. Um, they're all the symbols that we use on a regular basis. You know, is it the percentage symbol? Um, it, they're also confusing for a child with um, a visual processing issue and who has trouble remembering symbols and signs on the page. They can have difficulty remembering sequential orders like tables, days of the week. Um, all those types of things. Let's go into time now. So time is another big one. Again, I'd put, that, I'd put it in the maths category. Definitely an analog clock causes the most drama. It is a series of timelines that go round in a circle with a base of 12. And if you start thinking about an analog clock in that way, you start to understand why children who struggle with dyslexia and learning difficulties struggle so much with an analog clock and they much prefer digital. It makes so, so much sense. So they can have difficulty learning to tell the time. They can have poor timekeeping skills. They can have poor personal organization. They can have difficulty remembering what day of the week it is, their own birthday, the season of the year, the months of the year, all those things that we talked about a little bit yesterday as well. Difficulty with concepts like yesterday, today, tomorrow, and here's some skills for you to consider that can be signs and symptoms and indicators of dyslexia. They can have poor motor skills. I know we covered that yesterday. And that can lead in weaknesses to speed, control and accuracy with pencils, pens and even typing. They can have limited understanding of, of non-verbal communication. What is non-verbal communication? Well, this is non-verbal communication. That is a frown. A frown is non-verbal communication and they can actually misconstrue non-verbal communication, which is all the communication that you have in your body language, the way you look, the way you smile, you know, is it a smile or is it a grimace? You know, they can misconstrue that type of information. That's our normal verbal communication. Um, they can have difficulty and confusion between left and right, up and down, north, south, east, west, west, that is actually west over there. Um, they can have indeterminate hand preference. In other words, they can almost be ambidextrous from day one. And my son could play bat tennis with both hands from day one. And it actually took me until he was about three or four to work out which his dominant hand was. And I actually ended up using the preschool teacher to explain to me that he did 60% of all his fine motor skill on his, right, on his left hand, 40% was on his right hand. So technically he was a left-handed child, but he was ambidextrous for a long time. And that is very much something that you can do some research on when it comes to dyslexia. So unsure about if they're left or right-handedness, um, they can 
have days where they perform unbelievably well and they can have days where they perform unbelievably badly. Now behaviour is, again, I know I say behaviour is the number one indicator for me of when a child is struggling because that is always the underlying sign that a child gives you that they are struggling to do something that you have given them. As soon as they act out, fade away, um, get lost in their own thoughts, start staring out the window, get up and run away, that is when you know, go, well, whatever I'm doing here, right here and on this, at this time right now, is not working for this child. Um, thank you, Vicky. I'm glad you are enjoying the lives because that makes, means a lot to me that you are getting some information that can help you. So, behavior. They will use work avoidance tactics like the ones I just talked about. They can go and sharpen pencils. They can ask to go to the bathroom. They can break something, they can punch the kids next to them, they can shout, they can scream, they can refuse, they can be confrontational, they can sleep. I've had children in my class when they were really, and I was in a really uh, challenging area where I had children who would just, it would all come too much, become too much for them and they'd go, they would just go to sleep in class. And a lot of that was to do with the fact that they had a lot going on at home as well. And I invariably used to pull the bean bag out settle them down and just let them sleep because invariably that is what they needed to do. They can seem really dreamy. They can seem not to be listening. They can become easily distracted. They can be the class clown. Lots of really good comedians are actually dyslexic, a lot. Um, they can be withdrawn. In other words, they just switch off. They're not there anymore. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protection strategy. Uh, they can be excessively tired due to the amount of concentration that they have to put in to just being in the classroom for six hours every day. I know when my children used to get home from school, they would be absolutely mentally exhausted. And the last thing I did when they got home from school was get them to do their homework because that would have just tipped them over the edge. There was always something else I would offer after school. Um, and invariably homework did not, and my household did not take the form of formal homework. I'd always tweak it some way to just make it a bit more interesting. So a cluster of these symptoms alongside other areas of abilities and challenges can definitely be um, indicators of dyslexia. And uh, so what would your next steps be? And uh, I think first thing you've got to do is you've got to uh, speak with your classroom teacher. And if you're a teacher, you need to speak with your parents. And you can also remember you've got, a lot of you have got SENCOs in your school or you've got a learning support coordinator in your school or perhaps in your school it's your curriculum coordinator who also has that role in some schools. It's also the vice principal who has that role. Um, so it's really important to actually get those things happening. Now I'm just remembering what I did with my other piece of paper. Oh, here it is. I'm back again. So. Again, try and get some other people involved. Try and get a support team around your child. Um, and you need to work out what is the best solution long-term and short-term. Short-term, firstly, because mental health, when a child is struggling, is your number one priority. A child who is not coping psychologically and socially at school is not going to be saying give me more schoolwork and teach me they're going to be saying can we actually fix those issues before i can even begin to start to learn so focus on social and psychological uh, areas with a child who's struggling first and you've got to speak to the child because the one thing about children is they are really smart and they know themselves really well so ask them what they find hard and tell them it's okay because everyone has strengths and challenges and weaknesses profiles even the smartest people in the world have profiles of strengths challenges and difficulties and again i know there's a lot of you waiting to hear about when you go down the path of a diagnostic assessment and i am going to do a facebook live on that now today here is Wednesday. I know it's very early in the UK, so welcome all you sleepy heads in the UK who've just got out of bed. It's a bit later in the day here in Melbourne, Australia. 
and I think the people in the US are still asleep but they will be waking up not too far away and it will be of course Wednesday morning for them so uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more about diagnostic testing later in one of our lives in October I am going to send you out an email uh, it's going to have all the signs for preschoolers then I'm going to send you out a second email which is going to have all the signs for primary school then I'm going to send you out a third email which is going to have all the signs and symptoms for secondary school and that's what I'm going to cover on the Facebook live tomorrow I was going to send it all out once and Gillian said to me it's too much the email had got so long it was getting a bit crazy so I had broken it down so look out for those signs of um, symptoms of dyslexia coming in your email inbox and I will talk to you very soon have a super day everybody um, light it up red all around and uh, yeah looking forward to speaking to you again tomorrow bye